as an architect at WSO2. And like the previous nuance said, I focus mainly on the WSO2 API manager. So today, this session on advanced API management, I hope to do a deep dive on the product to help you guys understand its in in internals on how, each, how the components interact with each other, how the components interact with the database, and uh, basically to help you uh, build a solutions architecture that is, like one said, future-proof and you know solid, right? So that's the objective of the session. So to begin with, um, let's go into talking about the different components of the API manager. So I'm pretty sure by now most of you know about each of the components are. So I won't go into describing each of the components, but rather uh, looking at it from a higher angle. So the WSO2 API manager, like when you download it from the site, it comes in you know, one single binary, but it, uh, internally it has different profiles. So these profiles are also called as components, and these profiles are the publisher, the store, the admin portal, the traffic manager, the gateway, and the key manager. So all of these, when you download the product, comes in one single binary, but internally they are different, different profiles, right? So um, in most of the cases, this one runtime is suitable to address almost 80% of the use cases. For example, if you are deploying an API architecture that is that's supposed to like, take care of, let's say, less than 1,500 or 2,000 transactions per second, this one single binary is perfectly capable of doing that and you probably have two for high availability uh, scenarios, right? But in certain situ situations when you need more aggressive you know, transaction rates, and um, like if you want to deploy these components in a decentralized manner where you want to deploy the gateway in a demilitarized zone and you know, have the publisher and key manager internally. So when you want these kinds of requirements, it makes sense to decompose these different components into different runtimes, right? Uh, so that's when you, that's what we call as a distributed deployment, where you decompose these different profiles into different runtimes. And when doing that, we often choose, instead of giving a dedicated runtime for a dedicated, uh, for a single profile, we opt to uh, mix the profiles together to reduce our hardware costs and to reduce the number of servers we want, VMs we want, et cetera. So it's perfectly fine to do that. There's no issue in doing that. But however, what we need to understand, first of all, is that these components, like I've categorized, are of two different main types. There are scalable components as well as non-scalable components. So when you look at the solution and look at the user personas that are interacting with this solution, there are different types of user personas, such as your API developers, application developers, and end users. So say you have a group of 10 people who are developing APIs. Probably the number of people who are developing applications on those APIs would be in the range of, let's say, 50. And the number of users who are interacting with those apps or using these, those apps could be in the range of 1,000. So if you look at the numbers, it's like 10 to 50 to 1,000, right? So these 10 and 50 numbers, the API developers and the app developers are the people who are interacting with the publisher and the store components. The, the, the people in the 1,000 range, they only work with the gateway and the key manager because the only thing they do is to use those apps, right? So now if you look at it, uh, in terms of scalability point of view, it's really this gateway and key manager components that needs to scale. The publisher and store and the traffic manager and the admin uh, profiles, they probably don't need to scale that much. And that's how they have been designed. So those are categorized as non-scalable components, and the gateway key manager is categorized as scalable components. So when you're mixing profiles, it's important to understand that you don't mix across. Like, you don't mix a scalable component with an unscalable component. So for example, if you mix a store with a key manager, and if you want to scale out the key manager, now it becomes a problem because unknowingly you're scaling out the store as well which will technically work, but from an architectural point of view, it becomes hard to manage, and you are doing it uh, unintentionally. You don't intend to scale the store, but you still scale it out because it's combined with the key manager, right? So that's the first important thing to understand with regard to the components and their distributed nature, and when you're setting up uh, a distributed deployment. The analytics, of course, uh, comes along with the product, but it's a separate runtime. 
Uh, it's not in the API core runtime, it's a, a separate JVM. And it internally has its own profiles um, called the data receivers, which receive the events from the gateways and the data analyzers, right? So that has its own scaling uh, architectures and philosophies. I won't go into the details of that. Uh, so since it's not really in the same runtime as the API core, uh, you need to understand the analytics layer separately uh, in order to scale it out uh, separately. Uh, so moving on, let's try and understand the different types of data storages that are used within the product. So the product mainly works with four different types of data storages. One is a registry, the API manager database, the permissions database, and the analytics summary databases. So what the registry database holds is the API meta information. And what the API manager database holds is the API runtime information. So what's the difference between these two? The runtime information or runtime data is the type of data that is needed for the gateway and the key manager to serve your end users traffic. That data we call as a runtime data, and that's stored in the API manager database. And the registry database holds the meta information, so that information is not required by the gateway and key manager to serve your traffic. It's only required for the UIs and some of your other clients, for configuring stuff, etc. So this information that is not required for the, by the gateway and key manager is categorized as meta information, and they are stored in the registry. The permissions database basically holds the permission related information. The product has defined a set of permissions for performing different kinds of actions like um, publishing APIs, creating applications, all of that. So there are different permissions uh, defined for those. And so you have your users and your groups in your corporate LDAP. And then we have our set of permissions defined in the product. So the place where you map these roles with these permissions, like which, uh, which role can do which action, is this place called the permissions database. So that's what's in, in there in the permissions database. And the analytics database holds all the summary information of the API analytics, right? Um, uh, like how have your APIs been performing during the past month and all the API summary analytical information is stored in this. Uh, summary, uh, analytics summary database. So these are the four main types of uh, data storages that the product uh, deal, deals with. And I come up with this kind of matrix to help you understand who writes to and who reads from these uh, data sources. So the publisher, it reads only from the permissions database and the analytics database. It writes to the registry and the API, man API manager database. So the publisher writes to that. The, and the store, it reads from the permissions, analytics, and the registry, and it writes to the API manager database. So all information that is created on the store, like your applications, your application credentials, access tokens, all of that stuff that you create on the store is considered as runtime information. It's not meta information, because those information is required by the gateway and key manager to process your user's requests. Therefore, all information created by the store goes into the API manager database. And the key manager actually writes to the permissions database, uh, the registry and the API manager database, uh, everything. Because the key manager is like the place where you define the permissions and the permission mappings. It's where whenever a new tenant comes up, it creates the tenant's uh, key stores and trust stores, all of that stuff. And the key manager writes to the registry and permissions uh, DB and also to the API manager database uh, with all the access token information and all that. A traffic manager does not write to anything. Uh, it only reads from the permissions database uh, to make sure uh, like the right person is performing the right action such as deploying your policies and all that stuff. So the gateway is not in here because it does not read from nor write to directly from any of the databases. Um, so the gateway can operate without any interaction with the database. Uh, except in the case of multi-tenancy, where when you have a multi-tenanted deployment, it needs access to the uh, registry and the permissions data store. Uh, other than that, if it's a single tenant deployment, the gateway does not require any access, direct access to any of the databases. 
Right, so then I'll walk through some of the use cases, like what happens when you do certain actions on the product, and later on we'll move on into uh, talking about different types of deployment patterns and things to consider when setting up uh, deployments, right? So first up, what happens when you create an API on the publisher? So the publisher creates information in these two data stores. It writes the meta information that's not required by the gateway and key manager to the registry, and it writes the runtime information that's required by the <coughs> gateway and key manager into the API manager uh, database, right? So how does this API now appear on the store? How it appears is that the store reads information from the registry database, right, in a periodic manner. It's not on demand, it reads it on a, in a periodic manner, and creates an index in its local file system, right? So whatever information that you see on the store uh, UI is from the local file system and not directly from the registry. There's a periodic job that runs inside and reads data from the registry and indexes it locally. So this is, again, for performance reasons. Um, and that's basically how the data appears on the store, right? So once you've created the API, the next step is to go and publish it after reviewing, documenting it, and all that. So now you go and publish it. So what happens when you publish an API on the publisher? So there are two main things that happen. One is there's a notification that's sent from the publisher to the store to go and invalidate its local cache. So if this is a distributed deployment where the publisher and the store is running in two different runtimes, whatever update that you make on the publisher needs to be notified on the store so that it can invalidate its local cache and re-index the modifications that were done, right? So that's why um, when, you're, when you're setting up a distributed deployment, like we ask request users to have the publisher and the store in the same cluster. So in the same cluster means they are discoverable to each other and they are aware of each other's existence. So when, whatever hap updates that happen on the publisher are notified into the store. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that this API artifact is deployed into the profile called the gateway manager. So again, we are talking about a distributed deployment now, not a single standalone deployment. So uh, what happens when this artifact is uh, deployed on the gateway manager is that it creates an XML file in its local file system, right? So if you notice, I've highlighted the fact that this is a secure web service call that happens from the publisher to the gateway manager. So when it's a secure web service call, what needs to be done by the publisher is that the publisher needs to present some credentials to the gateway uh, so that the gateway manager can validate this action. So if the gateway manager is to be capable of validating these credentials, that means the gateway manager needs access to your LDAP and to your permissions database in order to validate these credentials. Therefore, sometimes we do make the mistake of deploying this gateway manager in the DMZ or having uh, one of the nodes in the DMC as the gateway manager as well. So that is not a very right thing to do because as you can see, the gateway manager requires access to an LDAP or a permission store to validate these credentials. So if the gateway manager is sitting in the DMZ, you can't have that connection to any internal LDAPs or your database systems, right? So you shouldn't be uh, making that mistake. And so this XML file needs to now be synchronized onto the gateway workers, which are the nodes that serve your end user traffic, right? So uh, this file synchronization needs to happen, uh, and you can choose whatever the mechanism of syncing up that file. It could be using rsync, it could be while having a um, shared file system mount, et cetera. And it could even be the uh, SVN-based deployment synchronizer, where we push to an SVN and get the workers to pull it down from there. So you could uh, have your file syncing mechanism of your choice. The need is to get this XML file synchronized across, across to your gateway worker nodes. So that's basically what happens when you publish an API. This API gets deployed all, all along uh, onto your gateway workers, and it appears on the store as well. So this XML file that we talked about, well, it looks like this. Uh, in the root element, you have the API name, obviously, prefixed with the user who created it. And you have the root path defined. 
and also the version. So in the world of Sagar, this context is known as base path. Um, and then the subpaths are uh, documented as resources. So you have several resources with subpaths, each uh, having the um, HTTP verbs that can be used to access them. And we have a set of handlers. The handlers are basically a set of Java class, classes, each class having two methods, one which is invoked on the request and another method which is invoked on the response. So going through these handlers, so these are the standard set of handlers that come out of the box uh, when you uh, create an API. So you could have your own set of handlers too, right? So these handlers are the, basically the classes that do the magic of uh, you know, secure, uh, securing your API, rate limiting your API, uh, pushing analytics, transforming your messages, all that stuff, right? So, uh, and they are executed in the order they are defined. And you could write your own handlers and plug in uh, to, the, to it as well. And you could define uh, where it is executed at because the order is always guaranteed. So that's the story. Uh, with an API, basically the content of the XML and how you can do customizations um, to it, to the handler flow basically. Okay, so we'll now go into API security and talk about uh, how these APIs are secured. So in the, in the gate, uh, API gateway uh, architecture, API security is applied at the gateway level and not directly <coughs> at your backend level, right? So the gateway acts as an interceptor to all your requests and applies security and rate limiting and all that. So like these APIs are always accessed by some kind of applications. So there could be different types of applications that access your APIs. And these different types of applications have different capabilities. They have different requirements, right? So the same API can be consumed by different types of applications with different security mechanisms, right? And in the world of API, uh, APIs, the, the, it's always an application that accesses an API on behalf of a user. So this accessing on behalf of a user is known as access delegation. So a user delegates its rights to an application to access a particular resource, right? So this is called access delegation. And access delegation is kind of mastered by the OAuth specification, OAuth protocol, right? And the OAuth uh, protocol specification defines different methods of uh, <clears throat> getting a credential for your application to access these APIs because these applications could be of different nature. For example, there could be applications that are trusted, developed by your own developers, that are untrusted, developed by third party developers that are capable of securing information like uh, web app and that are not capable of securing its own credentials like a JavaScript uh, application, SPS, right? So there are different types of applications like this and they have different capabilities. So for these different types of apps, in order to get a credential, the OAuth specification defines different types of protocols. These protocols are known as grant types, right? So OAuth specification has a dedicated set of grant types and it also allows us to define our own grant types as well, right? So we'll look at all these different grant types and see how they work. The first is the most simplest one, which is the client credentials grant. So in this case, there is no end user involved. There is no resource owner involved. The application itself is a resource owner. So this application should be capable of protecting a client ID and a client secret. It's like a username and a password in itself. And the client application, when it wants to get an access token, it basically presents its credentials to an authorization server, right? The authorization server validates the client's credentials and issues it issues an access token. So that's the most simplest form of um, getting an OAuth token. So in this case, there's no end user involved. The application acts as the resource owner itself, right? The next grant is the resource owner password credentials grant. So in this case, there's an end user involved. There's a resource owner involved. 
So the application needs to get an access token on behalf of an end user, right? So how does the application get an access token on behalf of an end user? Is by, in this particular grant, the application accepts a user's credentials, a user's username and a password, and the application uses these user's credentials and the app's own credentials and makes a token request to the authorization server, right? So the authorization server validates all of this information and gives an access token back to the application on behalf of a user, right? So these types of applications should be trusted applications because as you can see, in this case, the application accepts the user's credentials. Therefore, it has to be a trusted app and it has to be able to protect its own information. So this grant, the resource owner password credentials grant, should only be allowed for applications that are trusted and secured as well, right? Then we also have apps developed by third parties, could be web apps, right? They are not untrusted. So they cannot be trusted enough to accept an end user credentials, but they are capable of securing their own information. So in these kinds of cases, how do you get an access token on behalf of a user. So this is called the authorization code grant. This is a protocol that OAuth definition has provided. So how it works is like this. Whenever a user wants to log into the app, the client app makes an authorization code authorization request, authorization grant request to the authorization server. And when doing this, the application presents its client ID, its identifier, right? When the authorization server receives the, this request, it will validate the client ID, and if there is no valid session available, it will redirect, uh, send a redirect uh, to the user's web browser that redirects the user to a login page on the authorization server. Note that this login page is on the authorization server, right? So now the user enters his credentials on the login page of the authorization server. If the credentials are valid, the authorization server then redirects the user back to the client application. And this redirect URL is taken uh, from the moment the client application registered himself. So the authorization knows about what URL to redirect to based on the application identifier, right? And in doing this redirect, the authorization server sends uh, in the redirect URL itself, a temporary short-lived and one-time use token called the authorization code, right? So this authorization code is now given to the client application. This, uh, remember it's, a, it's not an access token, it's an authorization code. This authorization code can be exchanged for an access token, right? So now the client application has received an authorization code, which is a one-time use, one -time use token and it can then exchange this authorization code for an access token, right? And when the client application presents the authorization code along with its client secret, which is like the password, the authorization server will issue an access token to the application. So that is how <coughs> you get an access token for an application that is untrusted but capable of securing its own information, right? Like you noticed, the resource owner in this case did not present his credentials to the app, but he gave his credentials directly to the authorization server. So there are other types of applications that are both untrusted plus incapable of securing their own information, like JavaScript applications, single page applications which run on users' web browsers. So since they run on web browsers, they aren't capable of securing any of the information. They don't have persistence, encryption, or any of that stuff, right? So how do you get an access token for these types of apps? So it's quite similar to the earlier protocol. Whenever a user wants to log in, the application, uh, the client app initiates an implicit grant request. The implicit grant request is received, uh, is sent to the authorization server along with the client identifier, right? So if the client identifier is valid, the authorization server will redirect the user to his login page, just like before, right? So now the user enters his credentials on this login page, 
and if the credentials are valid, the authorization server redirects the client, the user, to a pre-known redirect URL which was registered at the time this client was registered, right? So the authorization redirects the client, and so this, uh, this is again similar to the earlier behavior. However, the difference is in this redirect, the authorization server issues the access token as well, right? So uh, the, uh, there's an example that's provided. So if you can see in that particular URL, the access token is provided as a URI fragment. So instead of having an intermediary authorization code, in this case, the access token is directly provided to the client in step three or four itself, right? Sorry, in step five. Uh, so this is how basically the implicit grant works. So uh, like the implicit grant is quite restrictive in the sense that as you can see, the token is provided in the URL and therefore it cannot be encrypted even if you use HTTPS because the URL cannot be encrypted. Therefore, when you're using the implicit grant, the recommendations are to use a very short-lived uh, access, uh, to have a very short time for the access token, and if possible, revoke the access token once you get it, once you use it, basically. Uh, you use it once and then revoke it. That's the recommendation. So therefore, this is quite restrictive, and there are certain practical limit limitations when using this implicit grant. Therefore, people are kind of encouraged to look for alternatives uh, <clears throat> instead of going with the standard or, or what uh, defined flow, right? So then let's try to understand the responsibilities of a key server in the API manager solution, right? So in a nutshell, a key server should offer authentication, authorization, right? And it should offer client registration. So what is client registration? So when a user logs on in, onto the API store and creates an application, that application needs to be registered on your key server, right? So the store sends a register call using the dynamic client registration uh, specification or protocol to the key server, right? So the key server needs to support this client registration protocol in order to register this client, right? So now, after the client is registered, what happens if you need to modify it or remove it or read it? So to support those kind of capabilities, the authorization needs server or key server needs to support client management facilities as well. Basically give the ability to retrieve those information, to modify the application information and to remove those application information. So those needs to be part of the features that are provided by the key server. Then it also needs to have capabilities, obviously, of token management, of issuing tokens, of renewing tokens, refreshing tokens, uh, expiring tokens, basically managing that entire token lifecycle. The capabilities of that should be provided. And it needs to have the capabilities of introspecting a token. Introspecting basically means checking if it's valid. So the resource server needs to call the key server to validate tokens, so it needs to have an endpoint to do that. And also token revoking. Whenever a token is no longer be being used, the key server should have capabilities of revoking that token. And uh, optionally, federation capabilities. So what federation is basically, say your users are not within your LDAP, say you want to develop an application and you want to enable Facebook login for that application, so your users are now in Facebook, but you want your <coughs> key server to issue an access token for those users. So in order to make those kinds of things possible, your key server needs to, be, needs to have the capabilities of federating with Facebook, authenticating your users, and issuing an access token from the key server itself. So that's basically what federation means in a nutshell. Right? So these are some of the capabilities that are required by a key server. So the WSO2 API manager uh, ships a very strong key manager. Uh, inside it using components of the WSO2 identity server. However, you can plug in any key server that's capable of these, uh, capable of these features that I just mentioned. So as long as there's a key server that's capable of doing all of these functions, federation is of course optional, but the rest of it more or less is mandatory. 
So if you have a key server that's capable of these operations, and those operations are exposed as APIs, you can plug in any key server with the WSO2 API manager. Right? So if you already have an OAuth system in your enterprise, you can leverage that uh, as long as these capabilities are supported. Uh, so we'll next look at how traffic management works. So traffic management basically is make ensuring that your users are always within the allowed quota. So the traffic manager component uh, consists of um, features from our complex event processor and features from our message broker. So uh, they are not a fully fledged CEP or fully fledged MB, but we use some of those components uh, for the scope of traffic management. So this guy called the traffic manager basically keeps counting all of your requests from your entire gateway cluster to make sure that the, it's always within the quota. How it works is that uh, your gateways serve all your requests of your client application, and for all the requests that are served by the gateway, the gateway sends events to the traffic manager, keeps pumping events to the traffic manager. The traffic manager keeps on counting it and validating those counts against policies that are deployed by the uh, policy designer, the throttling policy designer. So these policies can be defined by your system admins, so by your business users, uh, <clears throat> like determining how many requests you want to allow and all of that, right? So the traffic manager keeps on counting these against these policies and if a quota breach is you know, found, it will notify that to the message broker components that are running with it, right? So the message broker will take on the responsibility of taking that message out back to the gateways, right? So when the message broker notifies the gateways, the gateways can then block requests of those particular users or apps until the particular time duration has passed, until he is allowed to uh, access again. So that's briefly how traffic management works in, in the API manager. So when talking about scalability, one thing to note is that a traffic manager does not scale as aggressively as the gateways. Uh, a single traffic manager is capable of handling uh, 10 gateways at maximum capacity. Therefore, your traffic manager does not need to scale at the same aggressiveness of your gateways. So uh, it can handle 10 gateways. So if you, have, uh, if you need a deployment that uh, requires more than 10 gateways, how you should design this architecture uh, is by having a traffic manager per gateway group. Right? So uh, since it can handle up to 10 gateways, you would have traffic manager A for handling the traffic of gateway 1 to 10, traffic manager B of handling the traffic of gateways 11 to 20, likewise. So that's how the uh, deployment uh, or architecture should be done. Um, right. So we'll talk about analytics too. How analytics works is similar to how the traffic management works. Your gateways keep pumping events into the analytics engine, and the analytics engine performs different types of analytics on this, like real-time alerts to detect frauds for patterns, and likewise. So the real-time analytics is done in memory, and the, it sends out the relevant alerts when you know, certain uh, things are notified or uh, caught. Uh, for batch analytics, it persists this information. The analytics engine persists this information uh, maybe in a big data store, in a RDBMS, wherever it, it needs to be. And this information, the raw information that is stored is then processed as batches. And the information that's processed as batches is sent out in two different ways. One is it has a REST API that produces this information out, or it uh, writes to a processed data, a separate data store, and that data store is from where the graphs and charts read the data from um, to display the graphs and charts on the API publisher and store, basically. So that's basically how analytics works, uh, very briefly. OK, so then we'll talk about uh, deployments. So uh, like API manager has a notion of environments, right? So I'll explain what environments are. And any software company has a software, develop, a software development life cycle and different stages in the life cycle, such as QA and development, staging, production, likewise, right? 
So a common misconception that happens is that sometimes these environments are confused with the SDLC, right? But these two are very, two very uh, different concepts. The environment is not a state in an SDLC. An environment is different from a state in the SDLC, right? So let me explain what a stage is basically, right? So a stage could be like development, QA, staging, production, right? So between stages, you should not have any data being shared, like your data in your development environment should not be shared with your QA environment, and your QA environment's data should not be shared with your staging environment likewise. So all the data and the runtime within a stage should be isolated to that particular stage. The reason for having different stages in the, in the context of API management is for testing your APIs. So your API interface might have to change, you might have to do modifications, right? So that's why you would need these stages in the context of API management, right? So your API could move from dev to QA, and if something fails, come back to dev, modify it, then move back to QA. And without sharing this data, how you move these artifacts are by using different kinds of tools. So the API manager itself comes with an import and export tool where you can export from one place and import into another place, likewise. And you could get Jenkins to do that. There are different approaches of doing it. So that's how the data should be moved, or API should be moved across environments and not by sharing your database. When it comes to environments, so say you have an API that you want to publish to be accessible internally within your organization and externally from maybe within the cloud, right? So this internal gateway and external gateway are two different environments, right? These are not two different stages. They are two different environments. But your API information and the application information and all of that is common across both these environments. It's only the runtime that is isolated between these two environments, right? So that's the difference between an environment and a stage. An environment always shares a common data set, whereas in stages, it's always neatly separated and segregated, right? So this environment concept, something that happens often, is that the API manager has a concept of production and sandbox, right? So to the, this production and sandbox could also be considered as two different in run times, two different gateways, right? However, these, the production, the sandbox is not your testing environment. That's one misconception that always happens. Sandbox is not a testing environment. It's, it's the, both the sandbox and the production backend is your production system, right? The need for having a sandbox is so that your application developers can test their applications without hitting your production backend. That's the need or that's the requirement of having a sandbox, right? It's not for testing your APIs. Testing your API should be done in your dev and a QA stages. Sandbox is not for testing your API. It's for application developers for testing their applications, right? So that's something that clearly needs to be understood because we see a lot, lots of uh, miscommunication or uh, <coughs> mismanagement around these concepts in the context of API manager, right? So this table has uh, a set of differences, like uh, between stages and environments. A stage always represents a state of an API, whereas an environment represents the execution runtime. A stage between stages and API may go through modifications, but between environments, the API does not get changed. Is the interface remains the same. Maybe the backend URL changes, but that's a different thing. You shouldn't share data between stages. Across environments, you will always have a shared data set. Uh, the ownership of an API across stages may change because it may be your QA lead, your dev lead who is handling the particular stage. But when it comes to environment, it's a single API product owner who decides where my runtime where my runtimes are, where, where I want to deploy my APIs. So these are some like differences between stages and environments. 
So when it comes to environments, there's an, another common deployment where you deploy gateways in different regions, such as the US East and US West, right? So something that we have been having to deal with recently is that since in environments the data set is shared, you want to ensure that your East, uh, the tokens that were issued for your US East region is not allowed for your US West region and vice versa. So if you have a common data set, if you, like I said before, the data set should be shared. If it's shared, how do you ensure that this restriction is applied? So there are two ways to solve this problem, and this is the first way of doing it. The first way is that although you have a, a shared data set, we duplicate the data set between those two environments, right? So it, it kind of contradicts, contradicts with what I said before of having a shared data set, but the, your data set, when you duplicate it, it needs to be synced up. Right? So it needs to be synced up only selectively. Right? So you should sync up the data between these two regions without syncing up your access token information. Right? So if a particular access token was created in the west region, it shouldn't be synced up, synced up to the east region. That table should not be synced up, but the rest of the table should be synced up across these two environments, these two regions. So that's one way of solving the problem. But there might be complications because this is a master-master data replication and some other database vendors might not support it, et cetera. So there's another way of solving the problem. That is by using a token prefix. So say you have the key manager in your East region. You get the key manager in your East region to prefix your token with the string East. And you get the key manager in the West region to prefix your token with the string West, right? So now both these types of tokens go and get created in the same data store. And then you apply a policy on the gateway saying, in my East gateway, only allow tokens which are prefixed with the string East to pass through this gateway. And in your West gateway, you say, only allow the tokens that are prefixed with West to pass through this gateway. So by doing that, you ensure that none of the tokens that were created in the East region are allowed through the West region and vice versa. So this is the second way or second mechanism of solving, solving this particular problem. And this is some code that you need to write you know, for those extensions. So you need to put some extensions for prefixing the token and validating that prefix. So this is the class I won't go through it since you're running short of time. So this is basically maybe eight, nine lines of code to prefix the token. And this is the piece of code that you need to write to validate that prefix. So it's not a lot. Um, I'll talk about multi-data center deployments, and then we'll wrap up. So when it comes to multi-data center deployments, we've seen like three main types of multi-data center deployments. The first is a single master active-active deployment, single master active-passive, and multi-master active-active. So Master basically means the place where data writes happen, where your APIs are being created, where your apps are being created. So that's what the master is. So uh, the last one is probably the most complicated one to set up. But irrespective of the, these types of data centers, the fundamental of having a multi-data center deployment does not change a lot. The requirement is to have your runtimes in both the data centers separately deployed, your data in both data centers, databases separately created, and file systems separated out, right? And what you need to do basically is to sync up this database and sync up the file system. So as long as you manage to sync up the data and the file system, you can have a multi-data center deployment. So the frequency of replication and the direction of the replication depends on the type of data center that you set up. For example, if it's a uh, single master setup, you need to only sync from the master to the slave, right? And if it's an active-active setup, like all your data centers are serving traffic, then you need to sync up at a higher frequency, like let's say every 20 minutes or so, right? But if it's an active-passive setup, where your passive setup only comes up if the active data center goes down, like a disaster recovery, 
then you don't need, the sync up doesn't have to be very frequent. Uh, you could do it like at the end of the day, twice a day, likewise. Uh, and then uh, comes the requirements of syncing up the file system, right? So this is the trickiest part because uh, if it's a single master, then it's fine because you only have to sync up one way. But if you, when you have to sync up both ways, there could be conflicts. So it's kind of hard to resolve these conflicts without a human interaction. Therefore, probably the most easiest way to get out of it is to have a shared uh, file system mount with a replica, with a backup, right? So, yeah. So this is basically the need of what, what needs to be done if you are setting up a multi-data center deployment, which is a requirement that we are seeing quite often, that we have been seeing quite often in the uh, recent past. So with that, uh, I come to the end of the